Good afternoon, I'm Jeff Swanson with the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences here at Duke University School of Medicine. And I'm here to talk about risk-based preemptive temporary gun removal laws as a way to try to prevent gun violence here in the United States. This is an innovative legal and policy tool that three states have already put in place. A number of other states are interested in it. It's a civil court action with a public safety purpose. Basically, it gives police officers the authority to separate dangerous people from guns. When a judge determines that there's probable cause that someone poses a high risk of harming himself or herself or someone else, the guns can be taken away. A person has the right to get them back if they don't pose a risk. A lot of people die in this country every year as a result of a gunshot. 34,000 people, about two-thirds of them, by their own hand, uh, were suicides. This circle represents 50 people in a study that our group did recently in Florida, 50 people who ended their own life with a gun. As you can see, 72% of them were legally able to buy a gun on the day they used one to end their life. That's a problem with the criteria that we had. If we had a better crystal ball, could say that person's going to commit suicide, maybe you could say, well, let's make them a person prohibited from buying a gun. 28%, though, already were prohibited. They got a gun anyway. That's the other problem. It's pretty easy to get a gun these days, in some areas of the country in particular, without going through a background check. So that's why this kind of risk-based, preemptive, temporary gun removal scheme could be very important because it doesn't depend on just stopping someone from buying a new gun. If they already have 10 at home, it might not do much good. It also doesn't depend on them already having some kind of a record to make them a prohibited person. So let me talk about one state's experience with this law. The state of Connecticut was the first state to enact uh, such a law in 1999 in the aftermath of a horrible mass casualty shooting in 1998 at the Connecticut State Lottery. This law was passed. It requires a, a risk warrant, it, so the police uh, obtain a risk warrant from a judge ahead of time and they can go and remove guns if people meet the criteria. And there has to be a judicial hearing within two weeks to determine whether the guns are retained for a year or given back to the person. Now, this law was enacted primarily out of concern for violence against other people, but as it has been used, most of the time it's been because of suicide concerns. It gives family members a tool if they're really worried about a loved one who might be distraught or bereaved or kind of in some kind of emotional crisis and they have all these guns. They can call the police and the police can look at it and they can decide to use this risk warrant law. Go to the judge and get the risk warrant, go take the guns away. When we consider suicide from a population health perspective, we often think about it in terms of what we can see, what we can measure, like this block of ice that appears to be floating on the surface of the ocean. That's suicide. We can count these people who have died uh, by their own hand. But what we know about the epidemiology of suicidal behavior is that it's really a lot more like this big iceberg under the surface of the ocean with lots of people experiencing depressive symptoms, many of them having suicidal thoughts, a smaller but still a large number attempting suicide, and most of those who try to end their own life survive about 90% survive. And if they do survive, most people don't go on to die from suicide. They usually die at a later age from something else. Now that picture is accurate with one major exception, and that is if people use a gun to commit suicide. If they use a firearm uh, to end their own life, the whole picture, the whole iceberg is turned upside down, and only 10% of those who attempt suicide with a gun survive. 90% of them die. So that's why lethal means restriction is really important, a really important public health opportunity, particularly with respect to limiting access to guns. So I'm going to talk about the law in Connecticut in terms of suicide prevention. So the law was passed in 1999, it took a long time to be implemented, it wasn't used very much in, in the first few years, it's been used a lot more frequently in recent years. But in all that time, from 1999 to 2013, 764 cases of these gun removals were recorded. Most of them were men, 95% across the age range. A lot of times what happened when the police went to serve the risk warrant is they encountered someone who was in a mental health crisis. 
And so what did they do? They took them to the hospital, to a hospital emergency room where most of those people got admitted to the hospital and then were discharged um, and received treatment. So as a kind of a side effect of having their guns removed as a public safety measure, many people actually received treatment that they needed. But the bigger question is, did it actually prevent suicide? So what we did as a research project is we matched these 764 cases of gun removal to vital records in Connecticut to see whether these uh, people had died, and if so, what was the reason? And if it was suicide, was there a gun used? Now, if you know something about the prevalence of suicide in the population, you wouldn't expect any cases of suicide in 764 people because the rate is 12 per 100,000 per year. So, you know, at the population level, it's a fairly rare event. In our sample of 764 people whose guns were removed, there were 21 individuals who committed suicide, 21 suicides. That's a really high rate. If you think about preventing suicide by predicting it in advance, and that's a needle in a haystack, how are you going to find that person who's going to do it? Well, this makes a much smaller haystack with a lot more needles in it um, as a way of thinking about it. Now, when we looked at these 21 cases, what was also very interesting is that only six of them used a gun. Now, the rest, 15, used some other means. We can use that information to estimate the size of the iceberg, the number of suicide survivors underneath the number of completed suicides on the surface. Our best estimate is that those 21 suicides in our study, six with guns and 15 using other means, represent about 142 suicide attempts. And now we can do a kind of a thought experiment because what if the guns had not been taken away? How many more people would have died if they had had access to a gun instead of, say, a rope or a bottle of pills or whatever they used? We don't know that for sure, but using information that we do have from other studies about choice of means in suicide in the population and the connection between gun ownership and suicide, especially in men, we can estimate that the gun removal policy in Connecticut did save lives, probably between 50 to 100 lives in prevented suicides. And if we express that as a ratio to the number of guns removed, we would say that for every 7 to 16 gun removal, somewhere in that range, one suicide was prevented, one life was saved. 16 gun removals to save one life, is that high or is that low? That may be for the policymakers to decide. But we'd like to put this information in the hands of the policymakers so that they can know what is in the balance of risk and rights when we think about preventing gun violence. Whether you think it's high or low may depend on where you're standing. You know, we live in a country that celebrates guns, where the right to private gun ownership is cherished. We also live in a country where a lot of people die as a result of a gunshot. We need to think about a lot of ways of coming at this problem. Background checks, comprehensive background checks are important. Risk-based, temporary, preemptive gun removal may be another.